Hi, I'm Annie Fitzsimmons. I'm your Washington Realtors legal hotline lawyer. And this video is another in our series covering stuff you gotta do so you might as well know how to do it well. And once again, we are fortunate to be joined by one of your real estate commissioners, Sabrina Jones Schroeder. She's also an owner broker in Spokane of Exit Realty. Exit Real Estate Professionals, yep, in Spokane, Washington. And I to also- To be more precise. Teach, to be more precise. And I also am an instructor over in Spokane as well. So thank you for being with us. My pleasure. I wanna to talk today about transaction folders because one of the very first things an auditor will look at when they uh, either physically or virtually walk into your firm is a sampling of the transaction folders, the transactions, I'm sorry, handled by your firm and what the auditor can look at is the transaction folder. Mm -hmm. So Sabrina, a firm generates a transaction folder because it's brokers turn in documentation to the firm, to, their, to, to every broker, to their managing broker. In the next video, let's talk about the timeframes by which those documents are due. In this video, let's talk about what the contents of a transaction folder must include. Okay, sounds good. You go first. Okay, um, so you know, from a practical perspective, if you think about the anatomy of a sale, um, if you take a listing, you're gonna turn in a listing and then uh, when you receive uh, offers on that listing, you're going to turn in that signed around purchase and sale agreement. Um, and, th and those are the two obvious ones, right? Listings and, and sales. Um, what may not be so obvious, but is equally important to get turned into your designated broker would be any um, uh, offers that were not accepted. So in those multiple offer scenarios, uh, any offers the seller did not accept, any offers you've written on behalf of buyers that were not accepted, um, uh, any broker price opinions that you've written, letters of intent that were written, um, sales that failed, uh, and a couple that have come down the pike that uh, are maybe on um, everybody's radar as a, as a new ping would be referral agreements and buyer representation agreements as well. Yeah, it, it, in every transaction folder, you've got to have, there's a, there's a the, the, the WAX, the Washington Administrative Code defines um, item by item, the documents that must be included in a transaction folder. And those items include, Sabrina, help me with this list, but it's all agency and transaction documents. And if you've been in the business long enough, you know what a transaction document is. The agency documents, that's typically gonna be either a listing agreement or a buyer agency agreement. In property management land, it would be the management agreement. Uh, in tra for transaction documents, we're talking purchase and sale agreements, addenda to the purchase and sale agreements, the legal description exhibit A to, to purchase and sale agreements. Notices, any notices that were uh, generated as a result of the agreement. Termination agreements. Yep, yep. So anything that, that is an, a, a, a document signed by, by both buyer and seller, that's typically a transactional document or signed by one or the other and delivered to the other party. Yep, receipts. Uh, would need to be turned in to your designated broker. That could be um, earnest money receipts being the most common. Yep. Correspondence. This is a tricky one. This is a tough one for a lot of brokers. The, the, what the list actually says is material correspondence. And one of the questions I get a lot is, A, what's correspondence? I mean, that seems pretty simple to figure out what's correspondence, but, but, if, but if I just had a, a conversation with my broker, I mean, with my client, is that correspondence? And if so, how do I turn that in? And what's material? If I have an email exchange with my client about their son's birthday party, it's with my client, but it's about their birthday party, is that material? And, and so when I teach this subject, I usually say if it's a conversation about the transaction or about the property, err on the side of saving it. Mm -hmm. And if it's something that the Department of Licensing later says, oh, that's not that's not important, that's not material, you haven't heard anything by saving it. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have it and it was material and all of a sudden the department is looking for that communication because your consumer references it or let's give an example. Let's say that the buyer just casually mentioned to you, you know, it's it's day 10 of the inspection contingency 
and the buyer's got a lot of things on their mind, but they just happen to pa mention in passing, look, we're, we're working with our lender. We got to get our tax returns in. That's our deadline for today. We got to decide whether or not we're going to, we're going to lock our rate. Um, Escrow is looking for some paperwork, and we we just decided to not even ask the seller to make any concessions. The stuff that the inspector found weren't that big of a deal, so we're going to move on on that. We also want to go, and then off, you know, got, we're going to call the moving company, and they've got this big long list, and all of a sudden this little tiny detail of we're going to let the inspection contingency go without asking for any concessions. Of course, that's huge, right? But you just had this conversation with a client who mentioned all of that. That's material and that's communication that you must preserve in your transaction folder. So if it happened to be something that's in writing because it's in an email format, for example, then you can either PDF and print it off or PDF and send it to an electronic file or however, whatever format you put it in to, to store it in your firm's electronic files if that's how they're stored, that, then you do that with the emails. If it's an oral conversation that you had with your client on the phone or face to face, then you document in your transaction folder. You make a little journal entry. You, you, you identify the date with whom you were speaking, the time of day that you had the conversation, and then the general substance of the conversation. If it's all of those things that they're going to go talk to their lender and turn in their tax returns, go ahead and make note of all of those things, but make sure you include <laughs> that they said they were going to waive their inspection contingency because that's huge and that could come back as a big issue later. So that's one example of material correspondence. And I, and I would um, toss in with that, that material correspondence might not, might also be with people other than your client. Um, material correspondence could be with our affiliate partners. It could be with the lender, with the um, title officer, the home inspector, the closing agent. So don't, don't limit in your minds that material correspondence is limited to that with your client. Um, nor is it limited to email or um, or in person or telephone communication. It could be you're you're in the habit of communicating with your client via text or even social media messaging. Uh, however, it is that you are having these material correspondence with your client need to be preserved uh, in the office file, and that's a tough one. If you're communicating, I had one client that only wanted to communicate via Facebook Messenger. That is the only way she ever wanted to communicate with me and, and that became somewhat of a challenge to figure out how to print out all of those communications and make sure they got into the office file. Yeah. Brokers, it's a bright line rule. You have to preserve those material communications in the firm's transaction folder. So if you're commuting, communicating in a format that you cannot convert to whatever format it is that will then be preserved, I, I tend to think PDF because I'm super old and that's the, that's the one acronym that I know for something that's you know talking about a piece of paper that you can then save later whatever the format is though if it's not PDF whatever it is if you can't get the format the medium in which you're communicating whether it's Facebook or snapchat or Instagram <laughs> whatever your social media platform is or even your just general texting if you don't have a way to convert that to a format that you can then preserve forever, because that's how long a lot of firms hold these files, then don't communicate. Do not communicate in any, with respect to any material topics relative to your transaction in that medium. It's just that simple. And designated brokers, don't let your brokers communicate with, as Sabrina said, it's not just clients, but, but the broker on the other side of the transaction, lenders, inspectors, anybody. Mm -hmm. You can't communicate in a format that you can't preserve. It, it's that simple. It's not simple at all, I get that. But the, but the rule is that simple. Yeah, in my last audit, um, that was the, the one thing the auditor said to us, everything looked great, yay, gold star for us. But he said if I could point one thing out, I would suggest that your transaction <laughs> files that he audited seemed a little light on client communications. So it's definitely something they're looking for. Um, the other things that are required to be in transaction folders would be leases, any occupancy, right? Um, agreements with non-owners, um, advertising, which I think we're gonna do another video on, on that. Um, and the final settlement statement needs to be in that transaction folder with your designated broker as well. Yeah, um, picking up on a couple of those, Department of Licensing has said, if you ever, you as a broker, give the keys to a non-owner of property, 
without a written occupancy agreement. Now, in the last video, we talked about giving keys early. I'm not talking about that, and that's a different, <laughs> that's a different disciplinary issue. What I'm talking about right now is um, we might be days before closing. Buyer just buyer says, I'm just going to move a couple of boxes into the garage. Is that okay? Even if seller says that's okay, it's not okay according to the Department of Licensing, unless you have a written occupancy agreement between buyer and seller, you are not to give keys to one person's house to another person unless there is an occupancy agreement between those two people where the owner of the property authorizes you to give keys to the person who's receiving the keys. In our industry, we use Form 65A for buyer taking possession prior to closing, Form 65B for seller retaining possession after closing. That's probably the type of document that we're talking about in this scenario, but whatever it is, Department of Licensing says, if you don't have an occupancy agreement, you should not be giving keys. So that was one thing that... Well, and Annie, and I want to just piggyback onto that and, and suggest that when I'm teaching purchase and sale agreement and we're talking about early and delayed possession, first and foremost, I suggest that they're inherently evil and they should be avoided <laughs> at all costs. But if we're going to engage in that, there are no varying degrees of early and delayed occupancy. It does not matter that the buyer only wants to move things into the garage, and it doesn't matter that they're not going to be spending the night there. There's no varying degrees of occupancy based on it's only for the weekend. And it also doesn't matter whether rent is being paid or not. Occupancy is occupancy. Uh, and to Annie's point, if someone has the right to occupy that property for any length of time, for any purpose, whether rent is being paid or not, it's occupancy and a rental agreement must be signed. Sabrina, have you ever been aware of a circumstance where a broker gave keys to a buyer just to move boxes into the garage and then a day and a half later, the buyer had moved into the house? Maybe once or twice. Yeah. It, unfortunately, from the Department of Licensing's perspective, that happens far too often. Mm -hmm. and, and Broker wants to assume the best of their of their buyer, and maybe their buyer even believed when they said that they were only going to move boxes in, but then it just became too enticing to move the sofa and the bed and all of their clothes in also. So it's like, in, it, it, it's like giving candy to a child and asking that child not to eat the candy, giving keys to a buyer and saying, don't, don't go in the house, only put your things in the shop. It's yeah. not going to happen. And these are, these are tough love communication conversations you have with your buyers, but you must manage your client expectations in this regard. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing I wanted to pick up on that you touched on was advertising. Sabrina's right. We're going to have a whole uh, video on what advertising requirements are, but but setting that aside, what I'm with respect to this video where we're talking about the contents of a transaction folder, I say that you must retain in your firm's transaction folder a copy of all of your advertising. So that would be your MLS printouts, any ads you run on the property, if you've advertised yourself and a buyer was attracted to that and then signed a buyer agency group, any kind of advertising that you've run should be included in a firm's transaction folder. And here's what I want you to know. You're not going to find advertising in the list of required documents identified in the WACs for a transaction folder. Department of Licensing leadership has told me that they, it's likely they will consider that to be a form of material communication. I understand some auditors look for advertising and transaction folders, some do not. And, and so even if you go and do your own research and you don't find advertising in the list, I think it's important that you retain copies of all of your advertising for two reasons. One, it easily falls under the heading of material court communications. Two, if, if somebody alleges later that you advertised a certain feature in the home or you said something about the home that wasn't true, how are you going to defeat that allegation if you don't have a copy of your advertising? So again, in, the future, in, the next, in another video, we're going to talk about truthfulness in advertising. So long as you have been accurate and truthful in your advertising, your advertising, having copies of that is going to protect you in the long run. So keep those in your transaction folder. Okay. Anything else on this topic, Sabrina? Did you want to touch on referral agreements? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, just, just very quickly that um, it is important to turn in referral agreements. We have a tendency uh, to make these referrals licensee to licensee, and very often referral agreements are only signed by the receiving 
designate a broker. Makes sense. They're the ones that are obligated to pay out the referral. Uh, but it is so important that those referral agreements get turned into both designated brokers. Um, uh, there have been scenarios in my office where we've received a referral check and my bookkeeper has no idea who the check is meant for. They don't always come with a note um, that says, hey, this is the referral being paid to your licensee, you know, agent, agent X. So um, those referral agreements need to be paid and it is compensation to the firm ultimately that will be received and there needs to be an agreement in the firm to be tied to that uh, referral. So that may be the only only piece of paper in that transaction folder is that referral agreement and the check ultimately the check stub that comes in but those referral agreements should be turned in from a practical perspective as well as a legal perspective. Practical in the sense that I've had a designated broker recently tell me that an auditor looked for folders with referral agreements in them. So uh, yes audit or designated brokers auditors are looking for referral agreements in that long list of, of transaction folders. Okay. If you have questions on any of this or anything else, send an email to me, legalhotline at warealtor.org. Thank you for being a Washington Realtors member.